Hello and welcome to Past Forward, the Prince Deep Research offering that focuses on issues from India's modern history that continue to guide the present and determine the future. This episode focuses on the 38th anniversary of the Kanishka Air India bombing. I am your host Raghav Bichandani. I'm a senior correspondent with the Print and I co-wrote this piece with my colleague Humra Laik and Bandana Menon. Humra, do you want to start us off? Off the coast of Ireland in the late evening of 23rd June 1985. A rescuer from the British Royal Air Force retrieved a doll from the site of the airplane wreck. Frustrated with discovering a doll while hundreds lay floating dead, he would soon realize that every rescue would be lifeless. Another was a sari-clad body of an older woman, split in two and too damaged to retrieve. He watched the sari float away, the image haunting him for the rest of his life. On that fateful day, an Air India flight had disintegrated mid-air on its way from Canada to India. It became the deadliest act of aviation terrorism before 9/11, causing the death of all 329 members on board. Sikh extremists were the responsible parties, heralding an act of mass murder at the height of the Khalistan movement. It came after months and weeks of Indo-Canadians saying the same thing: "Air India ki flight mat lo." The Khalistani sentiment has always maintained a tenacious grip in Canada and its history of communal hatred still hurts Sikhs today. The celebration of former Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's assassination in Brampton early this month proves it. Many in the country are still haunted by the horrors of the aftermath of the Air India flight bombing. There were rumors among the Indian diaspora in Canada that something big was going to happen and plenty of signs were visible as well, but no one was paying close attention. The whisper network was loud enough for the Indian Intelligence Bureau to hear. They sent out a telex to both Canadian authorities and the Air India administration on 1st June 1985, asking them to take security measures to meet a terrorist attack on the flight. An explosive test conducted in a forest by Talwinder Singh Parmar, founder and leader of terrorist group Babbar Khalsa International or Tigers of True Faith, who Canadian intelligence were actually tracking. was heard and ignored it was mistaken as a gunshot by authorities surveillance was called off the very next day what's more canadian security was lax despite the evidence of threat sniffer dogs were missing from across canadian airports because all of them were at a training season in vancouver x-ray screens at the airport in pearson broke down on the day of the flight a man called manjeet singh called the airlines asking if his ticket was confirmed and was told that he was on the waiting list He then asked for his Samsonite luggage to be checked in regardless and therein was planted the bomb. The handheld sniffers which were supposed to be screened near the explosives did beep around the bag but security personnel weren't trained to detect it and so they let it pass. Despite further identification of several suspicious bags at Mirabel Airport, the first stop after takeoff from the Pearson Airport, cost considerations motivated the decision to allow the Air India flight 182 to depart because the plane was already late and it would have to pay airport fees and the suitcase with explosives took off along with the 329 passengers aboard on board perhaps the most damning of all James Bartleman then head of Canada's intelligence bureau saw a document that told him the weekly flight 182 would be targeted by Sikh extremists when he testified to this Canadian authorities did their best to discredit him. The John Major Commission headed by Justice Major was appointed to look into this bombing and the role of both Canadian intelligence and police. The commission's findings chronicle a shocking level of negligence and came down hard on the Canadian authorities, laying the blame squarely at their feet. Incredibly detailed and unsparing in its findings, the report points out the court cascading series of errors that led to the largest mass murder in Canadian history. and one of the most significant terror attacks on an airplane multiple people were arrested and tried for the crime including talwinder singh parmar but only one was convicted to 15 years in prison indarjit singh rayat a level of criminal negligence that was uh, verging on collusion if not active collusion uh, in fact uh, the events seem to suggest if you go back uh, the intelligence agencies were pursuing the principal conspirators right to just days before the actual event they documented the testing of explosives and then abruptly just a couple of days before uh, the incident uh, the surveillance was withdrawn now uh, in no intelligence system 
could something like this happen without absolute malice forethought this is not an intelligence failure this is not what the john majors uh, committee described as a cascading series of errors they are not errors this is malicious this is a conspiracy to facilitate a terrorist operation and this does not end at that juncture plans to bomb air india flight 182 were reported as early as 1984 according to veteran journalist terry meluski who cited three informants jerry budro harmel singh grewal and paul besso budro and grewal told of their direct involvement with the bki in august and september 1984 while besso claimed to have recorded a discussion planning out the attack in june 1985 Bodro revealed that he was offered two hundred thousand dollars in cash to smuggle a bomb onto Flight One Eighty Two, and Grewal independently told the RCMP about the same meeting between Vancouver-based Sikhs and Bodro. Miluski writes in Blood for Blood. Moreover, Besso had met with the purported U.S. head of the International Sikh Youth Federation, informing the RCMP not only of the plot to bomb an Air India flight, but also of the ISYF's interest in procuring automatic weapons and 75% pure dolomite plastic explosives to blow up bridges in India. But Budro, Grewal, and Besso were all deemed quote not reliable by the Canadian police and intelligence services, according to Miluski. The attack itself featured two bombs assembled by Vancouver Island-based auto mechanic Indrajit Singh Rayat under the orders of Parmar. The attack was carried out after two months of bomb assembly and testing by Rayat and coordination by Parmar, who reportedly spoke to fellow Babar Khalsa militants on payphones in code. On 22nd June 1985, Manjeet Singh managed to deceive a CP air agent at Vancouver Airport to check in his bomb bag onto Flight 182. This, despite not having a confirmed flight ticket beyond the Vancouver to Toronto leg of the India-bound flight, which was scheduled to stop over at London Heathrow Airport as well as Delhi's Palam Airport before ending at Mumbai. That fateful dark brown Samsonite bag evaded the beefed-up Canadian airport security requested by Air India for Toronto and Montreal. The bomb aboard the flight exploded off the coast of Ireland on 23rd June, killing all aboard and setting up a litany of questions for the subsequent decades. That same day, another BKI militant successfully checked in his own bomb bag onto a CPF flight bound for Japan's Narita International Airport from Vancouver in the absence of X-ray security checking. The bomb bag was intended for Air India Flight 301 scheduled from Narita to Bangkok, with the bomb planned to explode at the same time as the one on Flight 182. But the explosion took place an hour earlier at Narita Airport itself, as the militants had failed to account for Japan not observing daylight savings time. Two Japanese baggage handlers were killed in the explosion. The wreckage was strewn across the Atlantic Ocean, the remains of the coast of Ireland, and in that aftermath, the community was broad brushed with "You're not worth it," "Move on," "This happens," "There are wars," "Just move on." Often called Canada's 9/11, the ensuing trial was the longest and most expensive trial in the country's history, dragged on over two decades and costing nearly 130 million dollars. The Air India 182 trial moved from disaster to disorder to disregard to defeat. From a promising start with the RCMP and CSIS launching investigating agencies in 1985 to Rayat being charged with manslaughter and possession of bombs in 1991, the trial reached a plateau in the mid-90s after Parmar was killed in a police encounter in India in 1992. In 1995, around the same time, the RCMP offered a one million dollar reward for information leading to conviction. Tara Singh Hayer, a publisher of Indo-Canadian Times and a staunch critic. of Sikh extremism gave the RCMP the much needed smoking gun a conversation between Ajay Singh Bagri and a friend that practically laid out the entire plan the purpose was to make the indian government come on their knees and give them khalistan if everything had gone to plan the plane would have blown up at heathrow airport with no passengers but because the flight was delayed it blew up over the ocean bagri reportedly told his friend here a statement mentions With Rayat sentenced to 5 years in prison after he pleaded guilty of manslaughter in 2003, the trial of Malik and Bagri began soon after. A multi-million dollar high security courtroom called Courtroom 20 was especially built for this purpose. In an unsuspecting turn of events, the Crown's key witness came up, 
a woman who claimed that Malik fell in love with her during the early 90s and confessed to the bombing of Air India 182. Another twist followed. One more key witness got to have met with Bagri on CSIS cameras said she couldn't recall the visit at all. I can't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember. She repeated 20 times within one hour of testimony. Evidence wiped out, witnesses silenced or dead. Both the accused were acquitted of all charges in 2005. Malik walked out Vancouver's BC Supreme Court doors with a smile on his face. Meanwhile, in India, what was Canada's 9-11 was merely a blip that had happened 11,000 kilometers away. Except for a tokenistic call between Brian Mulroney and Rajiv Gandhi right after the bombing. The former expressing his condolences, the latter half chiding the Canadian government for not having the bags checked and both agreeing in the end that there was a quote sinister connection. There was no uproar in the Indian political corridors. The start of the forgetting, though, began somewhere between Operation Blue Star and the Kanishka Bombay, wrote Patrick Bithor in the Canadian journal The Globe and Mail in 2010. For other Canadians, that tumult was a foreign story at the back of the newspaper or at the end of a broadcast. Indira Gandhi's assassination was an Indian misfortune, not a danger signal. You know, there again, I, I think many families will tell you this was not treated as a Canadian tragedy. It was uh, treated as a, a, a tragedy of India's. Uh, um, uh, it, 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 some people looked at this as it was an issue or a, a crime that we brought upon ourselves uh, right. uh, with a perception that politics were brought to uh, Canada. Uh, but, you know, I can tell you, at least for my family, we weren't involved in any of the issues at the time. We weren't following Indian politics. Uh, uh, a majority of the individuals, I think 280 of the 329 who were killed were Canadian citizens. Right. And it should have been acknowledged as a Canadian tragedy and treated as such, but it was not. And that's not all. To the CSIS, the supposed bastion of Canadian intelligence, the world of Sikh Canadians was so foreign that officers couldn't distinguish one traditionally attired Sikh from another, according to the major report. So Sikh extremism had proliferated unchecked in Canada, one blindness growing from the other, and resulted in this cascading series of errors that we just spoke about, as well as the lack of specific threat, the bungling of the bombing under the RCMP CSIS turf wars, the blind eye to witness intimidation, and a culture of fear among the Sikh diaspora in the country. While posters of Parmar and Bindran Wale were plastered at Gurdwaras, and both figures hailed as martyrs, Key witnesses and moderate Sikhs lived under a fog of fear till well into the late 90s. I think everybody was afraid and if you said anything that did not support the cause of the people who were trying to support terrorism and violence, you will be called names and you will be called outside, testified Hare's son before the major commission in 1986. Hmm. And just as the bombing didn't ring into Canadian ears, the threats to the witnesses and other Indo-Canadians didn't budge their marriage. Sikhs in Canada were left to fend for themselves, with Canadian authorities being unable to deal with a wave of hatred, violence, threats, hit lists, silencing of broadcasters, journalists, activists, according to Ujjal Desanj, a former MP. He himself slept on his ground floor, laid out with mattresses or carpets for several years. His family huddled around him, fearing extremists would firebomb his house and they would all go up in smoke if they slept on the top floor. One watched once back all the time, the former MP quote. Today, Indo-Canadians in Toronto, Vancouver and Ottawa are organizing a memorial service to remember the victims of the tragedy. Keeping the memory alive is something that family members say they owe to the victims of the bombing because history ultimately can be easily forgotten. Thank you so much for tuning in to our debut episode of Pass Forward. Tune in to the Prince YouTube channel for more.